Hey guys, Annie and Ella here. We're the hosts of Undiscovered, the new spinoff podcast from Science Friday. This week on Undiscovered, Gary King and Jen Pan thought they were testing a new data analysis tool. That's before they realized what they were really looking at. And then we got one that said, this post has been taken down, it's been deleted, or it's being investigated. Investigated. That's when we knew that we were encountering censorship. Decoding Chinese censorship on Undiscovered. Find us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcatcher. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Now, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm telling office secrets out of school, but I, I got to tell you that a couple of weeks ago, our microwave oven at SciFry HQ broke down. Now, right? Not really a big deal, not big news, except the way it broke down, the way it broke was, was kind of dangerous. You know, normally when you open up the door, the microwave shuts off. But in this case, opening the door turned on the microwave. So here you found yourself looking, staring into the microwave oven with all these microwaves coming out. And, of course, it, it created a bit of anxiety on the team and, and prompted some other microwave safety questions. So producer Christy Taylor captured some of those questions and concerns around our office. I opened the door and it turns on, which is weird, but I didn't really think too much about it and I just stuck my hand in the microwave while it was microwaving to get my pasta. Then I was sitting at my desk and I'm like, does my hand feel weird? If it's cooking chicken, is it also cooking my hand if it is on with my hand in it? But like, what does a microwave do to body parts? Does it mess with my vision? Will it like give me like brain cancer? I know that microwaves are safe and I know this is a little irrational, but you know, I just want to make sure that this broken one isn't going to like, you know, kill me. I stayed away from the kitchen too, just in case people like you are going to be using it. How close am I allowed to stand in front of the microwave? Because I like to watch the cheese on my nachos melt. What is on the door that's protecting us from it? I mean, I see like the little meshy pattern. That's all that's needed. I always wonder if all the microwave food I eat is going to give me cancer the same way everything else is eventually going to give me cancer. Oh, God, what if it goes on fire? I've seen insects get microwaved and seem fine. How does that work? How much actual, is it radiation that we're getting from the microwave? Obviously, you shouldn't put your pets in there. I don't have that many questions about it. <laughs> I've just assumed it was a completely safe and effective mechanism for heating my pasta. Mm, yeah, there's that beep. So we had all these questions. And if we have all these questions, I'm sure you've had all these questions about microwave ovens. And even the history of microwaves is really interesting because 2017 marks the 50th anniversary of the first domestically available microwave, the Radar Range, which sold for $497 back in uh, 1967. Namely, because maybe you guessed, the scientist who worked with radar in World War II accidentally discovered that radar waves could be used to cook food. Another case of serendipity. And all these years later, even our geeky science folks in our office, me included, have apprehensions about this essential household device. So we're going to pull in some experts. And here to relate the life and times of the microwave oven and shed more light, visible light on safety, John Dragenberg, Consumer Safety Director for, U for UL, you know, the old Underwriters Laboratory, a safety science company that's been testing microwaves since their advent, and they are based in Northbrook, Illinois. Welcome to Science Friday, John. It's nice to be with you, Ira. Thank you. Timothy Jorgensen, an associate professor of radiation medicine at Georgetown University in Washington. He's also the author of Strange Glow, the Story of Radiation, out from Princeton University Press later uh, this year. Welcome to Science Friday, Timothy. Oh, thank you very much, Ira. Glad to be here. You're welcome. First question, for producer Annie Minoff's sake, is, is her hand going to be okay after that microwave en encounter? Well, the first thing I would recommend is to get rid of the oven. Uh, maybe it's John gone. can explain to <laughs> Maybe John can explain how it could go on when you open the door. Because I certainly I agree uh, completely. I agree completely. <laughs> Throw but, it away. Um, <laughs> the main hazards from uh, the main hazards from microwave ovens are come from heating. So you can burn yourself with a microwave oven. So um, that's the danger. So if the microwave was in fact on and she put her hand in it, she would have felt the heat and um, 
Hopefully she would quickly withdraw her hand before she got a burn there. But that's the main hazard with microwave oven. It's the burning. Mm -hmm. I I was saying a few moments ago the microwave has been in our homes for 50 years, uh, Timothy. I know you have written a bit about how we got it in the first place. And I I, I know the history because I've written a little bit about it. But it was a a fortuitous accident involving a a, a radar tube and a candy bar, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so there was this guy, uh, uh, Percy Spencer, up at um, Raytheon, and he was a whiz with uh, radar. And uh, he was uh, working on uh, developing radar for the government. And... um, one day he was working with an item called a magnetron, which is what actually produces the, uh, the radar waves. And um, so, the, so the thing was on, and um, he noticed that a candy bar he had in his, in his pocket was melting. And, um, and so uh, he attributed it, it must be coming from the microwaves. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so what he did was he took an egg, and he, and he aimed the, the radar uh, uh, a, a magnetron at the egg, and the egg exploded. Then he did something similar with popcorn, and um, and pretty soon he went on to patent that, and uh, and uh, it became the microwave oven. But but John, uh, these were not the tiny little ovens that we have today. Really, the first ones were gigantic ovens. They were as big as a refrigerator, and in fact, to keep the magnetron, which is the main tube that produces the microwave microwave energy, to keep it cool, they had to plumb it with uh, cold water so it would not uh, destroy the magnetron. So they had them only in big places, maybe uh, steamships in those days, had ocean liners and trains and places you could have a 700-pound box sitting <laughs> Yeah, you know, generally the restaurants. It, restaurants. It, it was a commercial device that was used only by restaurants or food uh, facilities of one kind or another. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get our listeners in on it because people are going to want to ask questions. 844-724-8255 is our number. You can also tweet us uh, at SciFry. Let's see if we can answer some of the questions that even our staff was asking. And, and the number one question I know that I get asked all the time about it is why don't the microwaves go through the glass? Right, if it's standing there, why, what's keeping them um, from going through the glass, uh, Timothy? Well, so the so the the glass has a has a uh, has a mesh screen across it with little holes, and those holes are spaced just right so that those waves will not come through, but they'll just bounce around within the oven. So that's a protective screen, so you can see through the holes what's going on in the oven, but the waves are not actually coming out and, and cooking you. That's, that's how it works. So, so how do you test whether there's, there's a leak, uh, John? How do you test whether there's a leak in the microwave door or the oven? When we test a microwave oven at UL, we do have meters that can measure the radiation that might come out of the door gasket area or even a ventilation opening. Uh, And we test every design to make sure that it does uh, meet the standard for uh, leakage of uh, microwave energy. But most microwaves today are are very good, and there are very, very few times that we've ever heard of anybody getting uh, burned or hurt from a microwave oven. But consumers have to understand, too, that if you do spill something in your microwave and it runs over the the edge of the um, where the door meets the uh, microwave oven, uh, you've got to clean that up if it gets to be a crusty mess there, uh, it could allow microwave energy to escape. So keep that door mm. gasket area very clean with a damp rag, and uh, that's the best uh, safety device that you could have is a damp cloth. Uh, Dr. Jorgensen, let's also talk about, you know, we, we in the vernacular say, I'm going to nuke something in the microwave. There's no nuclear energy or radiation of that type involved, is there? No. So um, it is radiation, but radiation comes in an in electromagnetic spectrum. So we have everything that from very long wavelength radiation, like uh, AM radio waves that are as long as a football field, all the way down to X-rays, which have wavelengths that are one hundredth of the width of a human hair. And the, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So microwaves don't have enough energy to cause biological damage as we think x-rays do. So, so the whole world of radiation can be divided into two. One is the non-ionizing radiation, which are the microwaves, the radio waves, the cell phone uh, radiation and things like that. And then there's the ionizing radiation, x-rays and gamma waves, who have w- w- they have wavelengths so short that they can actually rip electrons off of, uh, mm. off of atoms and cause damage. And it's those things we worry about, the ionizing radiations. The non-ionizing radiations do not damage chemicals. Right. They heat them up, but they don't damage them. Now, now, I understand that the microwaves heat things by shaking specifically water. They like the water molecule, and they shake the water molecule. That's right. What is the best 
thing to put your food in in the microwave to most efficiently allow the microwaves in to get to the food? Okay, so um, obviously uh, paper bowls and things like that, they don't have any water in it. They can, they can, uh, they can uh, allow the, the waves to get in very easily. If you, um, you, you obviously can't use metal containers because they'll block the waves. Ceramic will let a lar- large amount of, of the radiation in, so that's usually not a problem. Um, but um, th- anything that doesn't have any moisture in it is a good, is, is a good holding uh, vessel for... Um, for the food items you want to want to cook, mm-hmm. let's go to the. And that, that's, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Uh, that that's very correct. Uh, but sometimes now paper plates, if it's reconstituted paper, have little metal filings in them that uh, are not uh, mm. perceived by the eye, and that sometimes causes them to uh, look a little burned when you take them out of the microwave oven. Uh, it's something that we hear of ever so often. It's not terribly dangerous, but uh, the fact is, um, a paper plate that has. Uh, uh, reuse paper, which everybody wants to do because that's a very environmentally conscious to do that. But um, you can have that uh, situation. Yeah. And also, if you put a nice plate in there that might have a gold uh, trim along the edges of some kind, uh, that is uh, something that uh, would cause some problems, too, because it could heat that uh, gold ring, which is a metal, and it could cause uh, maybe the food to uh, get uh, too hot in certain places. And, and you know, people put those uh, takeout food boxes with the little metal handle on them, like the Chinese food in there, and they spark, right? Those little metal parts are kind of They spark. definitely can spark, especially if they touch the side of the uh, chamber or the cavity, as it's called technically. And uh, the same is true with aluminum foil. Uh, you can get away with it a little bit, but the fact is, once it touches the side of the microwave oven, you get gigantic sparks, and we've done some research on that at UL and, and can tell you that um, almost any type of aluminum foil could cause a problem inside a microwave oven. Mm-hmm. Well, let me see if I can get one quick question in from Kansas. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi. Um, I've been waiting 30 years to an- ask this question. I, um, in the 1980s, an osteopathic doctor told me that he said, um, "Don't do not use a microwave oven because it heats the food to too high of a temperature. It kills the enzymes, which is why we eat food." Those were his words. What do you say? Well, you know, uh, quickly because I got thirty seconds till the break. So if you can get it then, thirty seconds. Okay. No, the answer is no. <laughs> 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 um, the only the only thing that's going to uh, destroy um, food nutrition is if it does get too hot and you can make it too hot by boiling you can make it too hot in the in the oven on the grill and with the microwave it's so uh, don't worry about the All microwaves right. in that regard we're gonna stay we're gonna stay with this for a few minutes when we come back from the break so stay with us and we'll be right back uh, and talk more a bit about microwaves support for this podcast comes from tile what if you could find anything in seconds? Well, now you can with Child, the tiny Bluetooth tracker that makes finding your things easier than ever. You simply attach Child to your keys, your wallet, your laptop, even your bike, anything you don't want to lose. Then when something is misplaced, find it easily. Just open the free Tile app on your phone to see your lost item on the map, then quickly find your item by making your Tile ring and it'll be back in your hands in seconds. And if it's your phone that's missing, just double press on your tile to make it ring, even on silent. Every day, over 2 million lost items are located with tile. So join the millions who have used tile to help find their lost stuff. Get yours today at gettile.com Friday and save up to 30% per tile on a multi-pack, plus free shipping. And because tile makes the perfect gift, for a limited time, get a free gift box with a multi-pack order. Go to GetTile.com slash Friday. That's GetTile.com slash Friday. You're listening to Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. We're uh, wrapping up a little segment about uh, microwaves, microwave ovens with uh, John Dragenberg and uh, Timothy Jorgensen. Uh, John, at, at UL, where you are, uh, I understand that you test the microwaves with a baked potato. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, That's one of the many tests we do on a microwave oven. The leading cause of fires inside a microwave oven is popcorn and potatoes. And we uh, saw that there was an incident, a lot of incidents of fires inside of microwave ovens. And when we did the research on it, we found that it it was the popcorn and the potatoes. And we thought, what kind of a test could we develop that uh, would help that uh, problem? We came up with what we call the cavity fire containment test. 
And the way we do it is we put potatoes inside a microwave oven on the turntable, a number of potatoes, and we heat them until they're cooked. We heat them until they turn, get uh, very dry, they turn black, and ultimately little sparks appear across the peel and they burst into flame. And then you've got a flaming merry-go-round inside. But before we do all of that, we cover the microwave oven with a material called cheesecloth, which is our fire indicator. If that fire inside the microwave oven gets to the cheesecloth, it's a failure. If it doesn't, it's okay. It doesn't sound too okay when you know that you've ruined your microwave oven, yeah. but the reality is it saves your house and it saves your family from a, a possible terrible disaster. And that's simply because uh, very often we're in such a hurry, we push all the wrong buttons on the microwave oven and then run away from it. Nobody wants to sit there and watch the uh, food cook. Right. And uh, we find that uh, people, uh, you know, as hard as they try, they might uh, set it for three hours or some some huge amount of time and leave the potatoes or whatever's in there alone, and then you can get a fire. So we just want it to be contained so it doesn't spread to the bread wrappers or the paper right, towels right. on your kitchen counter. Uh, well, last question, uh, Dr. Jorgensen. Why, why are people so fearful of the microwave? Well, I think it's largely because um, you can't see it, you can't smell it, uh, you know it's there, you see it before your eyes what it's doing to food, and it kind of mystifies people, you know. And uh, the other thing, it's a man-made type of radiation, and people tend to be more worried about man-made types of radiation rather than cosmic radiation from space or radon from the soil. For some reason, um, people are more worried about the radiations that we make than the radiations that we encounter in the environment, I think. All right. We could talk about this for quite a while because uh, there's so much fun you can do with a microwave. But be safe when you do that stuff. John Dregenberg, Consumer Safety Director for UL, based in uh, Northbrook, Illinois. Timothy Jorgensen, Associate Professor of Radiation Medicine at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Have a great weekend. Thanks for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Ira. It's our pleasure. And now we're going to move on to something totally different. We're, we're going to talk about the ocean. With each splash of a wave in the ocean, the ocean makes a froth of bubbles. But what happens next is, is complicated. With each of these bubbles, when they pop, stuff from the ocean's surface can be released as particles into the air. And some of these particles can even get swept up into the upper atmosphere. Yeah, where they can interact with other chemicals, and potentially they can travel for thousands of miles. Uh, my next guest studies the chemistry of these aerosols and how they form and interact with the environment. She's written about plankton and bacteria in the aerosol process, and then she's published her work this week in the journal Chem. Vicki Grassian is co-director of the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment, Professor also at University uh, Dave, at San Diego, UC San Diego. She joins me from the campus there. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. I, thank you for having me. You're, you're quite welcome. So let's talk about the particles. What, what kinds of particles are we talking about that get thrown up into the air? So mainly we're talking about uh, sea spray aerosol. So these are aerosols produced from uh, wave action, from these bursting bubbles, as you just mentioned a moment ago. And they actually consist of a wide range of different compositions and different sizes. So one of the things that we wanted to do in this paper that just came out this week in, in the journal Chem was look at the de in detail at the molecules coming out of the water within these particles and try to say something about how that changed during the course of a phytoplankton bloom. Hmm. And so in, in general, I just want to add that uh, what gets out of the ocean are things like salts, typically that's what people think about, but also organic compounds and biological components, even, even whole bacteria. Hmm. Tell, tell us what happens when the bubble, are we talking about the waves crashing on the shore or are we talking about foam out in the ocean? What kind of bubbles are we talking about here? In this study, we basically looked at the uh, when we had waves and we have bubble bursting during that, that wave process, and we captured uh, the aerosols and looked at them individually to see what they, they were made up as. And what was unique about this experiment is that we did this in a... Uh, uh, a, a, an ocean atmosphere facility where we can cut off and, and, and uh, close off all other influences uh, and just look at that sea spray forming from mainly from that wave action. So you, we brought them inside into a big tank and created the waves and watched the bubbles, uh, created the foam, watched the bubbles burst. And, and how does a bubble burst? I mean, you, you, in slow motion, if you watch a bubble in your wave action, what, what do you see happening? 
So the bubble bursting process is something that I've learned quite a, a, a lot about uh, from my physical oceanography friends here at the, the University of California, San Diego. And basically what you have is you have the bubble burst so that the film bursts and then that forms film uh, drops. And then subsequent to that, you get the jet drops from underneath. And so whether you get the, the film rupture, that, that forms very small particles, which have a lot of organic compounds associated with them, versus the jet drops, which tend to form the larger particles, although we're questioning sort of uh, that understanding right now within our center as well. Um, yeah, well but that's, that, that's what we're interested in looking at is the different mechanisms and what molecules come out of the water because you, you, of these different mechanisms. you, you got to tell me what a jet drop is it's not a 747 hitting anything or like what is no, it no it's basically <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good point so basically when you have the film rupture um, there's some energy left over, and so what you end up getting is from the bottom of that drop some additional, if you were to look at that with a, uh, a microscope, you'd see another uh, small droplet of uh, water coming out of the ocean from the middle after that bubble bursting process from the top. So the film drops versus the jet drops, and one is bigger than the other, and so that's what we're looking at is the differences in the composition of each of these because how they mm. how they get out there is very very different. Yeah, and, and so once the stuff once you have your film drop and your jet drop, now we have droplets all through the air. Where do they go? Um, so these aerosols get into the air, um, and then they from uh, their formation they they go undergo long range transport, and so then they start uh, interacting with uh, gases and other particles in the atmosphere. And so uh, as they uh, move out from the ocean, they can really uh, change in terms of their composition, in terms of their uh, what they're associated with, whether they're associated with other uh, particles that were in the atmosphere from other sources as well. Mm -hmm. So when all these particles are traveling, they've, you've now got the particles in the air, and you, if you capture them in your lab uh, and you look at them under the microscope, what, what do you see there? So um, this, that's what this, this study focuses yeah. on is basically us capturing, and then ca we, we capture them onto a substrate. So we just put them on a, a piece of glass, a, a glass slide, if you will, and then we look at them in, in great detail in terms of their composition using a variety of different uh, state-of-the-art techniques in order to get that information about their composition. Uh, so we use a lot of what we call uh, spectroscopy in our in our lab or m mass spectrometry in order to see what the composition of each of these individual particles are, what they're made up of. Mm -hmm. And what are they made? What do you see? Um, so very interestingly, we see things like um, fatty acids. We see sugars. We see simple sugars like uh, glucose. We see more complex sugars like uh, what we call polysaccharides. So we see a wide range of different types of compounds coming out of the ocean. Uh, they also, these particles can, t can contain both salts, so sodium chloride, plus these organic compounds. And so what we were able to really do in our paper was look at individual particles and say something about their individual compositions. Wow. wow. I mean, it's fascinating by this. First, you, you've described two ways of the, the bubble. When the bubble bursts, I had no idea there's a compound action going off in the membrane and then the jet at the bottom. And then it, once you get these particles in the air, now I understand from reading stuff that for for storms, for example, for, wa for terrain, you need to have nuclei, little bits of stuff. Could the stuff coming out of the ocean form the nuclei that create some of the showers or thunderstorms or something like that? So um, that's that's right. Um, and so these particles can uh, nucleate clouds. Uh, they can nucleate ice crystals in the atmosphere. And so, yes, very much so. They can be part of um, how we think about um, precipitation and cloud formation. And so that's a big component hmm. of what our center studies. Um, and so what we provide is information on what these particles are made of, and then others provide information on how can they nucleate a cloud, how can they nucleate uh, ice crystals. Mm -hmm. So you, you study a lot of particles. Do you, do, you, do you study dust, just plain dust, too, in the air? You know, I'm the dust queen. 
<laughs> and what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said it and not me, because I'd get in trouble if I said that. Um, Is that what they call you around the, the office? The, the, the lab, the, the dust the, queen. Uh, I've been called the dust queen, um, and the reason why is that um, a, a lot of uh, my work uh, has also focused on mineral dust ah. and trying to understand mineral dust in the atmosphere. And mineral dust comes from uh, a different source; it doesn't come. It comes from desert regions, um, and they too can undergo uh, long-range transport. These dust particles, and very similar to sea spray, each individual particle is a bit different. And so what we do is we study the composition of these particles, we study how they react in the atmosphere, and we study how they can nucleate clouds. Hmm. So they, do they, um, can, can dust come, thinking about the water, can there be dust in the water too? You said that they're from dry places, but could you have dust be, being spread by the, the waves and the, the bubbles bursting? Oh, so now you're asking sort of another interesting question because, um, what, what we know is that mineral dust from desert regions um, undergo long-range transport, and some of it deposits into the oceans. And that's actually an important process because sometimes the iron in the dust particles uh, is a nutrient for ocean life under certain uh, mm -hmm. circumstances. That's often uh, that nutrient is limited. And so uh, the, we know the dust goes into the ocean, and then you're asking sort of the next question, does it come back out of the ocean? And so that's something that we're actually looking at um, in our center. Tell, tell me about the particles it's themselves. How, how large are they, ranging in size? Yeah, so that's a great question. So for the sea spray, I'll focus on that because that's what we started talking about. Uh, the particles are anywhere from, and I'll, I'll use my speak for a moment, and then I'll put it in a perspective. Please. They go from 30 nanometers, and a nanometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, to about 10 microns, where, or 10 micrometers, where uh, micrometers 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And so let's put it in a different perspective. So if I think about a single hair, okay, so these particles can be anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times smaller than a single width of a hair. Wow. Well, you've set off uh, my break meter. I have to, to remind everybody that I'm Ira Flato, and this is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with Dr. Vicki Grassian, co-director of the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment. And no wonder you, you have a long name. You study a lot of things like that. Um, so how much of these particles, I'm thinking now about pollution, how much of the particles that get spread around the world are natural, and how much are they man-made? person-made, people-made particles? So that's a great question because, and that's, that's a lot about what we think about um, as well, because we really want to understand um, natural sources of aerosols, what their uh, input into the atmosphere is, and then we can better understand what the influence of pollution particles may be particles from anthropogenic mm -hmm. sources. So from a mass perspective, if we were to weigh all the particles, many of the particles in the atmosphere are uh, from sea spray and from mineral dust, so from dust storms and from wave action. But when we look at the number of particles, so if we look at it a little bit differently, instead of just weighing it, we look at the number, um, a lot of the smaller particles are actually uh, anthropogenic particles, pollution particles, as you just mentioned a moment ago. And so um, it depends on the size. It depends on the, whether we're looking at number of particles or mass of particles. Well, but both are very important in the atmosphere. Both play a role in well, the atmosphere, well, I should say. How, 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 how are, you, are you seeing nanoparticles? Because the ubiquitous, these man-made nanoparticles, are you seeing them being spread around in the air by so, the waves so there or the are, dust? So I, I just uh, told you a moment ago that some of the particles coming out of the ocean are nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we actually, so they're naturally occurring nanoparticles. Natural, so natural ones. Not, that's not, right. Not that we engineer those particles, but, uh, those kinds I'm speaking of. Yes, and so then there's a whole other set of particles, engineered nanoparticles. And so, yeah, you can see some of these, uh, some of them, some of the engineered nanoparticles um, can make it in the air. There's been some studies to try to quantify that, but um, I think that's something we're still yeah. interested in understanding um, and interested in knowing. And so these things would be like 
you know, titanium dioxide nanoparticles or zinc oxide Make stuff nanoparticles. From makeup and, and things makeup, like that. sunscreen. Right. I'm gonna so just think about sunscreen for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you put it on and then you go into the water, it comes off, then you come back and put it on again. So where did it go? Oh, what a question. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still with us, obviously, right? It's getting washed off in the ocean, and then maybe the waves are going to throw it back up in the air. Go maybe. Take... Do people think enough about this, do you think, paying up attention to this stuff? You know, um, I think we could think more about it um, because there are consequences to everything we do. And so I really do feel like sometimes we don't think about the next step. Yeah. So I put this on, I go in the water, it comes off. Okay, you know, the, the ocean is large. Do you think it just goes away, far away? Or, you know, does it stay? What is it made of? Is it at the surface of the ocean? Can it come back out into the air? I think that's, those are questions that are really important to think about and to ask. I'm very glad that you brought that up because it's uh, always something good to think about. Leave, leave everybody with something Good to think about. Thank you, Dr. Grassian. Uh, Thank and, you. And have a happy Mother's Day, if you are. Uh, Vicki Grassian, co-director of the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Climate and the Environment in San Diego. We're going to take a break and we're going to start talking. We have more to think about, especially about how marijuana, that's right, how marijuana could make old brains sharper. Yes, you heard me right. We'll talk about it after the break. Stay with us. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI. Getting ready to finish up with the rest of the program. And I thought I'd uh, read, uh, uh, here's some tweets that came in about our last segment. Let's uh, uh, read Pomeroy says, Remember, keep door area clean with a damp cloth. Avoid fiery merry-go-round. And uh, people really <laughs> were surprised. I think this was the most interesting uh, comment we got about using, you know, that baked potatoes. And it's a question of, is this a new meme? Instead of a dumpster fire, we have a we have a microwave potato fire. So people are talking about that. So let's let's move on to some other interesting stuff because I have a, I think I have a story here that's going to be as interesting at least about the uh, fire in the microwave, and and that is about uh, marijuana, a new marijuana study uh, that shows that in in older people, uh, marijuana a study in, in in mice at least in older mice showed that uh, when given to the mice, they had a sharper sharper memories by the end of the study. And in fact, they were on par with younger mice who hadn't had any exposure to THC at all. And they published the research in the journal Nature Medicine last week. So what does this mean for those of us with aging human brains? And how do we continue research with marijuana, which is, as you know, classified as a Schedule I drug and that means federal regulations limit its use in actually conducting research on marijuana. My next guest, I think, has some insights on that. Stacy Gruber is director of the Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery and the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Core Programs at uh, McLean Hospital. And she's associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard and Cambridge. Welcome to Science Friday. Oh, well, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So this was done in in mice, right? So let's <laughs> we have we know how hard that is to move that into into a, people studies. Right. So we're, are you saying we should we should start prescribing pot to everyone who's starting to lose their car keys? <laughs> Not yet, I'll bet. <laughs> well, that would certainly be an interesting headline, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think people would be very interested in hearing that. So you know, I think these types of preclinical or animal studies are always extraordinarily interesting and always very helpful in terms of areas like this where we absolutely positively need more research. Um, you know, these, these um, studies of mice, and in this case, you know, three different groups of mice, um, certainly give us some really interesting ideas about what might be happening. And it, it actually dovetails pretty nicely with what we see in recreational uh, human marijuana users um, in addition to more recent work in mm -hmm. medical marijuana patients. So it's interesting. These were not, you know, in studies sometimes they give massive doses of things to lab animals, but this, this was not a massive dose. Give, me, give, give us a thumbnail of what happened here. So in this study, there were basically three groups of mice, and they had young mice that they term, term young because they're two months old, mature mice that are a whopping 12 months old, and old mice, which are, I guess, mice that are about 18 months old. And they basically fit, you know, half the animals in each group are what we call vehicle or control, and the other half 
um, are, are given THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, the main psychoactive constituent of the plant, right? Mm -hmm. And they did this using uh, sort of a subcutaneous pump method. So it's not like they're, you know, somebody said to me, well, are they smoking little tiny joints? No, they're, they're, not, <laughs> they're not inhaling it. Uh, so it's low dose that's, that's administered sort of subcutaneously into the skin. And what they did was they tested the animals first and determined that, in fact, uh, sort of consistent with what we know about aging, young mice not exposed to THC outperformed the mature and the old mice because, in fact, we get a little bit worse with regard to cognitive tasks as we get older. It's very sad, but it's true. Mm. Uh, what did you say? Can, no, just yeah, yeah, What was that? Say <laughs> it again. <laughs> yeah. there, there are things we can do, but that, that's generally the, the sort of pattern that things, things tend to follow. Interestingly, um, the young mice, after being exposed to THC for 28 days, performed significantly worse than the mature or old mice who actually performed better than the young mice. So a little bit of THC to the young mice made them perform significantly worse. That is, they looked like old mice who hadn't been treated, while the mature and old mice who were treated with THC looked like the young untreated mice. Hmm. Now that's very interesting and very similar to what we see in what we call um, early onset uh, exposed individuals who use marijuana or cannabis at an early age, sort of in our studies prior to the age of 16. Those folks tend to look worse than individuals who began using later. That's because the brain is still absolutely positively immature. It's, it's what we call a period of neurodevelopmental immaturity. It's vulnerable. So exposure during this early period really renders them less able to do these tasks relative to the mature and older mice. The really interesting take home though is what's happening in the mature and old mice who are doing better than the young mice after being given a little THC. And that's something that we're starting to see emerge from at least our ongoing longitudinal study of patients certified for medical marijuana use who look as if they get better on cognitive tasks after um, only three months. We followed them for two years, but the first set of data comes after only three months they look like they're performing better. That's hmm. very interesting. Well, do, does it make a difference that the rats were given, as you say, pure investigational THC? It comes from a lab, absolutely pure, as opposed to people who might buy marijuana on the street. So a good question that really speaks to what is it that they're being exposed to. And this is, again, yeah, purified THC. Very different from what folks on the street, so to speak, recreational users might be getting. But I will say um, while there's other cannabinoids present in recreational cannabis, we've seen the levels of THC, that is the potency of products, increase pretty sharply over the last two decades. And that's also important. Um, it's certainly something to keep in mind as we think about the role of THC and other cannabinoids. But, you know, in, in the human subject studies of the medical marijuana patients, those folks are on products that are high in THC, but we also have folks who are on you know, using products high in cannabidiol, a main non-psychoactive or non-intoxicating constituent. So it's a good question. It may be that a little bit of THC helps sort of uh, upregulate the endocannabinoid system in mm. these aging animals. That's yeah. a real possibility. I, I, is, it, is it difficult to investigate uh, marijuana and THC because of the regulatory landscape, the classification that it's in? Well, it's it's certainly um, not the easiest area of investigation to to embark upon. That's for sure. Um, the very best thing to do with studies like this is to replicate clinical trials in human subjects. And in fact, currently, there's only really one source from which you can obtain um, product to administer to human subjects. And we certainly wouldn't ever be in a position to be able to administer products like that to, let's say, our youngest consumers, our adolescents. That's probably not going to happen uh, for all sorts of, of ethical reasons. But yes, it's an area that's difficult given the current restrictions. Um, we, we aren't able to use products that patients and consumers are actually using you know, from dispensaries or their local dealer. We can't assess the impact of those products, which is a real limitation. Hmm. So um, there's good news and bad news about the study. <laughs> good news and bad news. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think this is certainly the kind of thing that um, absolutely demands more research. And, you know, chronic low-dose treatment with THC or perhaps other cannabinoids may, I think the authors say, be a strategy to help slow down or reverse potential age-related deficits. We'll have to see how that plays out in humans, but it's it's certainly promising and, again, 
uh, I wasn't necessarily expecting what we've seen in our, our first studies yeah. of medical marijuana patients. Very exciting. Well, could it be could it be another reason to have medical marijuana if it's one of the, for prescribing it? Yeah, uh, you know, there's so many different indications, and there's always the caveat in many states. You know, you can use it for this indication, right. this indication, or anything your doctor feels is necessary. So, you know, to improve or increase cognitive performance, typically what we see in the THC-related literature or, or studies of recreational marijuana really have been reports that THC is detrimental to the brain. But again, mostly those studies focus on individuals who are young. Yeah. We don't necessarily Dangerous. know about the impact on, on older folks. And when you're beyond the level or beyond the period of vulnerability, could it potentially be facilitative? Mm -hmm. We don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll have you back, Dr. Gruber. <laughs> sure, happy to come back. Stacy Gruber, Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery Program at uh, McLean Hospital and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard. Can you guess what this next sound is? <coughs> No, it's not what you think it is, <laughs> my friend. Is a, that's a young New Zealand sea lion pup, also known as Hooker Sea Lion, and it's one of the rarest of all sea lion pups. It lives in New Zealand, of course, and it's just, just 15 of them were born on the mainland last year. The species was hunted to extinction from the New Zealand mainland, but it's been making a comeback in recent years, and that's the topic of our latest Macroscope video. Video producer Chelsea Fisk went to New Zealand to capture the sound of those pups and their parents to see what it takes to help that group of sea lions bounce back. Welcome to Science Friday, Chelsea. Hi, thank you for having me. What, what, <laughs> that was a strange sound. I never expected that to be a sea lion pup. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed a lot of people online were saying that they basically are just burping. Um, so <laughs> that was a new take I hadn't heard before. But it's very cute in person, I assure you. Yeah, I was ready to say, excuse me, you know, thinking people thought I was doing it. Um, now, there, there was a large population of sea lions that once lived in, in the mainland in New Zealand at one time. Yes, that's correct. Um, they're, they used to be found uh, all over the on the coast of mainland New Zealand. And then hundreds of years ago, they were hunted to extinction. Uh, the subspecies that was on the mainland was hunted to extinction, leaving only the subspecies remaining on the subantarctic islands, so like the Auckland Islands. Um, so, yeah, that was hundreds of years ago, and then not until uh, 1993 was there one female sea lion who they affectionately call Mum, who swam up from the subantarctics, and um, a farmer, a local farmer, actually found her and a pup um, back in 1993, and that was the first pup to be born on mainland New Zealand in probably over 200 years. And now, all of the pups that are uh, being born on the mainland now pretty much all descend from this one female. So it was pretty remarkable. And it was pretty out of the blue, too. No no known reason. She just kind of decided, you know, huh. I want to look for greener pastures. Yeah, so. wonderless there. Um, do they, are they all in one spot? Are they hemmed in? Are they conserved? Or what, what happened? I'm trying to get a visual picture of where they're sitting or lying around. Sure. So, so as far as the uh, Auckland Islands, you know, if you if you see visuals, they look uh, it's, de it's definitely more densely populated there. As far as the New Zealand mainland, um, there are only maybe 200 or so uh, sea lions that are considered residents of the mainland at this point. Um, you know, there are some visitors that come yeah. up from the Auckland Islands, but they're, they're not densely packed. If you see, you, you know, you're lucky if you might see a couple together on a beach. Uh, but typically, you know, especially with these new mums, they're on their own with their pups. Hmm. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with uh, Chelsea Fisk, who went to New Zealand uh, to uh, create our latest uh, macroscope uh, video. Um, let, let's, let's hear what that, for people tuning in, let's hear what that pup sounds like again. Now 
that it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, I, and I, did, do I understand this correctly, that you found, you actually discovered a pup yourself? Yes. Um, we were very fortunate. I was with my husband, Brandon, and uh, the Department of Conservation there was very generous, especially with their one... Um, basically sea lion whisperer, this ranger, Jim, who you'll see in the video. And he had kind of shown us the ropes, how to identify where sea lions have been. And so uh, Brandon and I were on a beach one day just sort of getting some B-roll, and we were heading back to our car, so climbing up these dunes and through a brush area. And I heard exactly what you just played, um, a tiny little bark. And, uh, you know, we knew enough to know that that was a pup. So we looked around, saw an area that had been kind of flattened because these are huge creatures, so they tend to flatten any brush that they uh, sort of move over. Mm. And so we crawled under this bush, and there was a little newborn pup, um, probably no more than a week old, uh, under the bush. So it was very exciting, especially because, as you mentioned, there were only 15 born on the mainland this year. And... Um, what the New Zealand Sea Lion Trust does is they typically, and we had found this out beforehand, that they anyone who finds a sea lion pup is usually granted the rights to naming that sea lion pup. And so we did find out uh, that that was a male sea lion pup, and he's also featured in the video. But we are uh, open to suggestions as far as names. We have not chosen a name yet. Um, typically they like to do names that are, related to Maori culture or uh, science, wildlife, New Zealand, you know, trying to avoid the uh, fluffies and princesses and things of that nature. So, so, so open far, open to ideas. So, <laughs> so you're welcoming our listeners to suggest yes, names. Yes, yes. I would, I would love to get some suggestions. Okay. I was never, I was never very creative with naming my stuffed animals, so this is <laughs> sort of a... <laughs> Big task. <laughs> yeah, a lot of beanie babies. Uh, uh, <laughs> so if you want to suggest a name, we're going to set this up here for people who are listening. They really want to suggest a name, and you say we, we want it to be related to New, New Zealand or Maori or science or wildlife, none of those poofy names that people come up with. Um, you can send it. Tweet us. Tweet, tweet us your name for the pup the, at SciFry, the normal tweet address, at SciFry, at S-C-I-F-R-I. Tweet us your suggested name for this uh, New Zealand pup. And um, we will. You'll you'll judge it. You'll you'll judge it yourself, Chelsea. Uh, yeah. I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, it's it's ultimately up to this New Zealand Sea Lion Trust, so they will have final veto power. But I will cull through the suggestions and and uh, offer them my favorite. How's the how is the uh, the, the uh, population doing now? So the population, um, it's interesting, actually, the, the population on the Auckland Islands, which has uh, historically been more robust, is actually on a decline. And whether that's due to, um, you know, a, there's a problem with bycatch with fisher fisheries, and also, um, you know, that population down there is actually having to go much further to forage for their food. So whatever the case may be, that that population is decreasing, and so it makes it especially important um, that the mainland population is steadily on the rise. So mm -hmm. okay. 15 pups born this year, which is like a record. So great we're hoping for more. Yeah. Well, we'll wait to see what our listeners come up with. Hopefully better name than I can suggest or get away with. <laughs> Chelsea Fisk is a video producer. You can see our late, her latest macroscope video up there on our website at sciencefriday.com slash sea lion. And that's about all the time we have for this week. And if uh, if you haven't heard the news, SciFry has just launched a new audio documentary podcast called Undiscovered. The first episode is up this week. You can subscribe to Undiscovered on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player or go to undiscoveredpodcast.org. B.J. Liederman composed our theme music. Our thanks to the City University of New York.